This is my third conference in two weeks. This is the third conference in two weeks because I unfortunately cancelled the one I was supposed to be at last weekend, which would have made this the fourth in two weeks. So I ask for your patience and understanding and perhaps a little bit of participation. Um, as I said, usually I start my talks with a little bit about why I'm qualified to be up here and why you should listen to me for the next 45 minutes. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure I'm thoroughly unqualified to give this talk. For once in my life, that's not just imposter syndrome talking. I went to a 400-year-old university, not only came top of my class with a double honours, uh, got a bachelor's and a master's in four years, did well enough to earn a gold medal. I've worked for MIT's Media Lab in Europe, for Microsoft and for Google, for startups, for my government, for the university. I've lived in half a dozen countries and presented in, at conferences in several more. But I can tell you a little bit about what inspired me to propose this talk. In 2009, long before I'd ever heard of Kickstarter, a friend of mine in the UK put up a pledge on PledgeBank. And the way that PledgeBank works is that you promise to do something if enough, if enough other people will join you in doing it. Um, Sue, who put up this pledge, and I had been friends for several years. We'd worked on open rights stuff together. Uh, and I had joined her in a previous pledge not to drink any sugary drinks for three months, which had actually gone really well for me. And I see the horrified faces. But, but we didn't include alcohol. Uh, <laughs> there's only other drinks that contain sugar that we weren't drinking, so no fruit juices, no milk, no, you know. Um, and actually, I had, it had gone really well for me. Um, Sue has a habit and continues to do really cool stuff. And so when she started this pledge, I was in straight away. Um, the pledge got almost twice as many people as, as was expected, and Ada Lovelace Day was born. And if any of you haven't heard of Ada Lovelace Day, you should take a quick note and look that up afterwards. Um, as I read the post, the point of Ada Lovelace Day was to write a blog post. We would all write a blog post on the same day, or at least publish it on the same day, um, about a woman in technology. Uh, and as I read these posts and as I talked with friends, I realized more and more that the problems with diversity and open source went much deeper than just the numbers, the numbers of women and of other minorities. Um, our distribution was also way off. Where the men in our communities followed a fairly normal or Gaussian bell curve distribution of talent, the women were overwhelmingly up in the top centiles. There were almost none below the top quartile. Um, and Rich Bowen, who was and continues to be the leader of the Apache Web Server Documentation Project, uh, expressed this quite eloquently around the time that I was starting to think about it. And so I'm going to just quote you some of what he said. Rich said, I've been thinking about the topic of women in open source for some time. For context, the percentage of women in IT is about 20%, and the percentage of women in open source is about 1.5%. Which brings me to my point. The women I know in open source are way above average. By which I mean, quite simply, that almost all of them make me feel stupid by comparison. <laughs> I've written 13 books, I can read several languages, and make myself understood in more of them. I have a master's degree in mathematics. I'm no slouch. But then I look at people like Scud and Alison Randall and Elizabeth Naramore, among others, and feel like maybe I should have paid more attention in school. But see, if I look around all of the open source projects that I'm involved in, all of the women are this caliber. There are no average or below average women in open source, it seems, which makes me look at some of Scud's statistics and wonder. Sure, men are unaware of the problem because they look around and see these amazingly talented women working with them and figure, how can there be a problem? But apparently, when you're a woman, you have to be amazing just to get past all of the old boys club and macho chauvinism that pervades the entire open source culture. And that's what Rich said four years ago. And sadly, although we have a lot of people working on bringing in more women and bringing in more minorities and bringing in more diverse opinions and perspectives and skill sets, we still have this culture that all of those groups are way overrepresented in the top centiles, and we just don't seem to have room for the hobbyists, the people who just want to contribute occasionally or want to engage on, on a lighter level or just aren't you know, as completely dedicated to it as all that. And certainly the names that we know about in open source, the guy who invented X, you know, all of those people are surely throwing themselves in wholeheartedly and completely. But among 
you know, the cis white men. We also have the people who turn up once or twice, you know, do drive by patches. You see them at conferences, they come out to the parties. And we just don't have those in the groups that are underrepresented. I don't think I need to parrot the open source initiative or talk about the free software definition, but open source should be diverse. There should be so many ways of doing things. We are here to scratch an itch. We all have such different itches. There should be room for more. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes, and I'd like you guys to engage with me. I'd like all of you, guys and girls, to engage with me in talking about how can we improve this? How can we make room for more? Um, I have some slides which I'm not even going to go to until we've gotten a little bit going because I know this can be a fairly quiet audience at this conference. Um, but I have some slides about some of the initiatives that are happening. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing your perspectives. How many of you, just to get a vague show of hands, how many of you contribute to open source at some point during the year? Those of you who don't have your hands up are probably wrong. The fact that you're here is a contribution in and of itself. Um, how many of you do it once a month? Weekly? Daily? How many of the people with their hands still up, even for the weekly, let's go back to weekly, how many of, the, of those of you with your hands still up are paid in some way for doing this? Almost all, I saw one hand go down. Okay. So, as long as we have this assumption that people can't contribute or, or can only contribute fully if they're contributing on a, on a hardcore, you know, weekly or, or frequent basis, we're going to have this same disparity. And how do we make our projects more welcoming? How, how many of you are in projects that are working on some kind of initiative to get new people in? How many of you have come into a project through one of those initiatives? Could those of you who are in projects that are working on those initiatives just have a quick look around while we put up the hands for, for people who have come in through those initiatives? We have two, three, maybe. We, have, we maybe have four. How many of you, again, are, are in a project that has some kind of initiative to bring new people in? <laughs> so what is it that you're doing at the moment? Any of you who are willing to tell me, and I'm, I'm going to have to repeat back so it gets on the recording. I'm on an advisory panel with Clark College to build out a uh, curriculum that's based on open source. Okay, so building out curricula with second, third level? Second career. Second career, okay. Um, so through a traditional education system, building out a curriculum to get people contributing to open source. Other things that projects are doing? Yeah, so some of the examples. Okay, so some of the examples at Mozilla are self directed and organized ways of getting people who are interested, who have come along and said, I have these skills or I'm interested in contributing in these ways, and making sure that they have the resources and can find what the next steps are. Other things that projects are doing? Yeah. I, you have your hand up with the sysadmin t shirt, or I. WordPress admin? Oh, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We're doing a GSOC and OPW for students and women. Um, we are doing a Canvas course for students and women. And then we're doing a Canvas course for students and women. And then we're doing a Canvas course for students So the Google Summer of Code and the Outreach Project for Women, which are both uh, organized mentoring um, opportunities. <coughs> is the, the Outreach Project for Women, is that? limited to students? That's not limited to students. Okay, the, the Summer of Code is limited to students and is limited to code. The Outreach Project for Women, I think, is not limited to code. And gender, transgender and genderqueer and, okay. Mm -hmm. 
And both of those, thank you, that's, that's important to know, both of those are paid contributions, which as we saw from the people who are contributing on a regular basis, being paid for your work is important. And, and those of you who have a background in sociology will perhaps know that it's more important uh, for women and for minorities because they tend to have fewer, um, fewer opportunities to, to make the big books elsewhere um, and more second shift work and more <coughs> tendency to have other things going on in their lives that are that are demanding of their time and attention. Any other programs that are going on? Yep. Uh, we have Rails Girls Summer of Code that just started this year, and we're paying them to contribute to open source. And also, the Ruby Opportunity Scholarship that helps people from all diverse backgrounds and lifestyles to attend conferences. So helping people to attend conferences, and the Rails Girls Summer of Code is that also paying students or paying women just in general? Women. Okay, paying women in general to get involved and, and to make contributions. The thing I notice about a lot of these programs, particularly about the outreach project and the Summer of Codes and so on, is that we're expecting people to make substantial contributions. And we're still not opening the doors for those, <coughs> those smaller contributions. Are there any of you who have projects that are working on those things? Yeah, so localization communities, which can be as simple as changing, you know, one word or one small translation. Um, localization is actually how I initially got involved in open source, because there's nothing more annoying than using an interface that's perfectly clear and cromulent in English, and then you switch over to the language that you prefer to use, and it's like, you want me to what? That's not what that word means. That's just not what that word means. <laughs> <laughs> the word open is fairly simple and straightforward in English, not in all other languages. <laughs> th I'm going to leave that right there. <laughs> As someone who's a localization, I perfectly understand how you feel. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, um, with us in Wikimedia Philippines, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sponsor people. Um, first, it's actually three things. One, we're starting up with a startup initiative for MediaWiki. This is just so we can get more Filipino contributors to contribute to the, um, to the code base for MediaWiki. Because we noticed that particularly for Southeast Asia, we're very underrepresented in terms of the underlying code that runs the project. But on the other hand, we're also trying to do, um, we're trying to engage editors um, to contribute not just to Wikipedia, but let's say to other projects. That's why for us, a lot of our big projects are photo projects, because we feel that, that you know we're, we probably will have better success in getting photographers to give their photos once in a while than to really create more new Wikipedia editors, which in fact is the third part of our projects, which is we're trying to create more editors by giving incentives. Even if you know they only contribute once in a while, at least we try to make them feel that they're still part of the community through edit-a-thons and meetups and the like. So that's specific to Wikimedia Philippines. Philippines yes. So that's a local group that are working on, on an initiative locally, um, which also ties into the localization, tends to be in, in local communities. Um, and what they're working on, I'm just repeating it so we get it on tape, is um, getting people working on the code base because they have a community that are there but who are underrepresented in the, in the actual code and development, also working on getting contributions that are non-code and non-traditional contributions, I would say, because I think, certainly my perception from outside the Wikimedia world, when I think of contributing to, uh, media, to Wikimedia, I think of Wikipedia and of editing and of creating text, whereas there are so many other ways to contribute, like, for example, photography, images, stuff like that. Uh, and there was one other piece, I'm that sorry. Was the actual that was the text contributions. Okay, and, and then, of course, the, the classic text contributions that we all expect. Um, how many of you have only been contributing to open source for less than a year? Nobody? Wow. How many of you know somebody who's been contributing to open source for less than a year? Oh. <laughs> that that's still not a whole lot of you. Actually, that's like two thirds of the room only know people who've been in this more than a year. That suggests to me that, that either we have a 
very experienced audience and we should be able to get some really cool stuff done. Or we've got all the wrong people at this conference. <laughs> That's a very good point. So, so the very good point is that people don't necessarily talk about what they're doing because there is, as we, we heard in uh, Denise's imposter syndrome talk, it's, it's fairly common that we, we think, oh, well, what I'm doing isn't really real or it's not really contributing until I get to the point where I'm an editor or I have a commit bit or I have a module or whatever it is. Yep. Yep, but sometimes people don't know about conferences, um, conferences in general. And I think perhaps this conference suffers a little more from that because it is not a conference for a specific community. Um, and and we're perhaps it's, it's harder for us to find um, new people. I do know there are people here who are so thoroughly new that this is their first contribution to open source, um, coming along and helping out at Open Source Bridge and, and getting involved that way. Um, and I laud Portland greatly for creating those opportunities and welcoming people in in that way. You also have a selection bias thing here where you get a group of people that have been doing it for a long time, so they kind of know other people who have been doing it for a long time. And where people that can take time off during the week to do something like this. So I think you're not going to get a lot of beginners who have done the small amount of Uh, so the point is made that we have a selection bias of people who've been doing this for a long time, no other people who've been doing this for a long time, um, and people who can take a week off work to come and hang out with other cool people downtown, you know, during, during what is, you know, a fairly, a fairly busy time for a lot of us, um, are naturally further advanced in, in their careers and their participation than others might be. Um, the one thing I would say to refute that is we have a lot of students in this town. And finals for everybody I've heard of finished at least a week ago. Um. Not sure if this is the case here in the US, but in developing countries, at least in my country, um, it has been the case where it's either A, there is no community, so you have to make it yourself, or B, the community is so obscure, you don't know where to find them. And so you're, you know, sometimes you're left grasping at straws, wanting to find where like-minded people are, but you don't know where to find them. I think, I think that is a problem not only in the Philippines, but in, in a lot of countries. We're spoiled here in Portland that it's very easy to find a huge variety of diff different technical communities. It is not so in most of the rest of the world, in, even, even in other US cities, um, to find such a variety of open source communities and such a variety of what I hope are beginner welcoming communities. Um, so do we have any other, do we have anybody who's interested in working on the drive-by contributions, the small pieces, the, we have a couple of small hands. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not seeing the huge enthusiasm for this. Yeah, 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 so Lena points out that, that, you know, small hands for, for small enthusiasm and, and no, I mean, there, there's a totally valid point. There's a totally va valid point there that, you know, it's very easy to get excited about people who are going to be a core part of your community and put in a lot of energy to build people up to the point where they are contributing large pieces of work, whatever that work is. Um, it's harder to get engaged and excited about enabling so many more people to do these tiny little pieces, because sometimes that can be just as much work and it feels like the payoff is not as great. Um, I don't entirely have a solution to that, but yeah. So we were um, going to try this year to optimize for those people and make their small, bite-sized contribution of those, like just a weekend to get people wrapped up into having their first one question. How do you do a little drive-by passes? And what we ran into was that we needed to create so much documentation to explain what they needed to do that everyone kind of burnt out on having to do that much documentation and so they just kind of let it slide to go back to the work they actually enjoyed doing. And 
And we as the WordPress community, is that correct? So the WordPress community, we're, we're looking at encouraging these smaller contributions and drive-by contributions, uh, but found that the amount of documentation and the amount of prep work that was required to facilitate those was such and was not necessarily exciting to the people who are already in there, um, that people burnt out and it never entirely got off the ground. Yeah, mad props for the documentarians. Uh, we, got, we got our own round of applause in the keynote, and I think we totally deserved it. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, and I think that's a classic problem of documentation that's written by engineers and developers, is that it can tend to be written for engineers and developers, and it assumes a certain level of knowledge. Yeah, um, and and so that documentation assumes a certain level of knowledge and and doesn't necessarily uh, give you all the the tools or the steps that you need simply to go from step zero to step one, which is downloading and, and compiling the code and getting something that builds before you've ever patched it. <coughs> yeah, if you can't get something to build, you can't meaningfully contribute back to it. You can occasionally contribute back to it. Um, it, it occasionally goes hilariously wrong. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the, su yeah. the suggestion was that rather than trying to complete the documentation before you get contributions, to write the skeleton of the documentation and to allow the new contributors or to ask the new contributors to fill it in as they go along. The problem with that is that the people, even when you have the documentarians who love writing documentation, they don't necessarily have the subject matter expertise or, or you know, the technical detail that's needed. Um, I know this has been, I, I work as a technical writer on a professional basis, and this is a perennial interview question, is how do you get that information out of your subject matter experts? And that's a question when the subject matter experts are being paid to work with you, and, and this is their job. This is their day job, you know? And, and it's still a question, and I still have, I work for a company that are based in Santa Barbara, and I still have times when the answer is, I get on a plane, and I sit you down in a room, and I don't let you leave until I have what I need. <laughs> no, 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 literally. You're not, no. Uh, yes.
Yep. I'm not going to flick forward in my slides because it was 3.30 in the morning when I was writing these and I don't think Dreamwith actually got on the slides, but the DreamHacks program is, uh, is, is an excellent example of one way of making it easier for small contributions to come in without having to download the whole code base, get it up, get it building, get it running, you know, figure out how this whole server thing works. Um, they have a, a system whereby you can simply email in and say, can I have one? Can I have one that works? Uh, <laughs> can you give me one that works? And then I'll, I'll make my changes. And, and if it's still working, I'll send you in the patch. And if it's not working, there's somebody there, you know, either on the other end of an email or on IRC or whatever it is that you can talk with and say, it was working two minutes ago. And here's what I've done. What happened? <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's common when you have these, these, these kind of situations where half the time it'll be an easy fix. Something's gone wrong. Okay, I can see you've left out you know, some punctuation mark that your language demands or, or spacing or whatever it is. And half the time it'll be like, how did you manage to do that? That's really interesting. <laughs> and the people who are running and maintaining these things can see the difference between those two cases and know who, ha who has the expertise to solve the, that's really interesting. Um. That goes over there. So the dream hacks aren't, aren't being actively, you know, nobody's looking over your shoulder at what you're doing, but there are knowledgeable people who have access to the pieces of the system they need to poke at if you're having a problem. Um, did you have no. um, The other group that are working hard on, on facilitating drive-by contributions are OpenHatch. Um, I think they got a slide. I'm sorry, this, was, this really was early in the morning. Oh. These slides were not supposed to still be in there. Was it back? Did I? There we go. There we go. <laughs> yes, we found it. Um, OpenHatch is a nonprofit that's dedicated to matching prospective free software contributors with communities, tools, and education. Um, and they do this in a variety of ways with in-person um, workshops, Python workshops particularly. Um, they have training missions, which are essentially like you know, your video game training level of let's, let's literally get step zero sorted. So let's get a development environment up and running. Let's get the code downloaded and building. Uh, let's make a very first minor change. Um, they have workshops, as I said, for women, for students, and so on. And they have this project Rolodex, um, which is something that I have seen community members be very, very good at for reasonably experienced people who are interested in switching communities. But I think we fail to do, as, a, as an open source community as a whole, we often fail to do for beginners and newbies, which is saying, well, what is it you're interested in? And what is it you want to do? And who are you in the same time zone as? And, and you know, who's working on, on this right now and has time and energy? And matching up those potential contributors who come to you and go, I don't know what I want to do. I've heard about this open source thing. It seems cool. Uh, with people who are willing to, to hold those hands and, and help people get involved, uh, even if they don't have an immediate, yeah, that thing is really bugging me. I need to fix it. Okay, so it may be that that, that website is, is not the very easiest to navigate. Um, Ashish is here, and I know we'll gladly take your feedback. Um, he has a talk tomorrow, and I would, I would honestly, I would, I would say to all of you, um, if you're interested in this topic, going to Ashish's, Ashish's talk is probably a very good use of your time. Um, and, and he does take feedback well, if there are problems with the website. Yeah, did you have? I thought I saw a hand. Um, 
So I'm going to go through some of these slides, um, largely because there are happy children looking at me. And I think you should, you should share in the happy children. Um, one child's not happy. <laughs> one child's not happy? No. Oh, one child is really not happy. <laughs> yeah, OK. One child is very unhappy. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, but the. <laughs> yeah. Um, but part of the point of, of this slide um, was that everything I needed to know to become an open source developer, I learned in kindergarten. Um, and so there really is no reason that we should need to be rock stars in order to contribute. Um, cooperation, following directions, looking after each other, communication, trust, um, all of these things are things that we need to get by in the world. And they're all things that we should all have and we should all be able to exercise without having to, you know, be incredibly good coders or, or very well integrated into a project. We should be able to show these qualities to people who are just coming by our projects briefly and momentarily, as well as the people who are investing in us wholeheartedly. Um, open source licenses are not the same as an open source development mod mod model. Pardon me. Um, it's important to, to keep your code up to date and to keep your, your branches reasonably tidy and, and well maintained so that there isn't this case of somebody pulls something out, says, OK, I'm going to work on this. And before they manage to get their fix in, you've put in six months of your last contributions, and suddenly everything has changed out from under them. Um, you need to learn to play with others and not just play side by side. Uh, documentation, how to's, give people directions, let them know where they're going. Um, show them where they, can, where they can watch and learn, where your sandbox is, where they can try things out without breaking it for everybody else. Um, document how to use branches or whatever the equivalent is in your version control system. Let people mess around without messing up everybody else on the team. Um, remember that manners have a cultural dimension. What seems to be rude to you may simply be a different communication style. What seems to be very meek and, and unsure, similarly, um, try and be encouraging where you can. Try and be encouraging of those who are brash and brusque to just tone it down a little bit and be more welcoming. Um, and clean up after yourself. Again, version control is a great way of doing this. Version control should be a newbie's very best friend. Because anything you do, no matter how badly you break it, we can go back to the bit where it was working. And it's important to encourage newbies and to encourage people who maybe have come by before and have forgotten how things work and aren't really sure how to get back into it. Version control is their friend. Version control is there to allow them to do what it is they want to do. Um, communication, constructive criticism, please. Gentle, constructive criticism. Clear criticism, but positive comments are good. Um, test your email client. Know who you're sending your emails to. <laughs> don't say anything in an email that you wouldn't say to the person you're talking about, but don't send the email about them to them unless you meant to do it. Um, if you can, as experienced people in your projects, listen out. Listen through the flames and through the grief and through the stress and see what is the actual point being made. Because more often than not, there is one. Um, most people don't flame just for the sake of flaming. You probably know by now who the exceptions in your community are. Um, be respectful and considerate. Don't engage in personal attacks. Praise in public, criticize in private. Um, praise people, criticize code. Um, remember that the people who have come to you are here as volunteers. Um, you might not get a quick reply. You might not get any reply. They've sent you a patch. That might be all you ever hear from them. You might have to integrate that patch yourself or decide that you're not going to. Um, but a little bit of work put in to communicating, to being patient, to being open, 
can change that from a I'm just going to I'm just going to throw this over the wall to an ongoing contribution or at least somebody who will come back the next time they have a small contribution. Um, review other people's contributions if you can. Be a member and not just a supplier. Um, admit your mistakes and wherever possible seek out face-to-face -face opportunities. I think local communities are so important for this. Um, letting people come by, hang out, even if they never contribute. We have the Portland Hackathon here and most of the time, we don't even pull out laptops. Um, some of it is just about getting to know people, getting to know who to ask, who to talk to, who can help you when you do have problems. Ultimately, as all of you who have made it here to Open Source Bridge know, community is everything. Thank you.